much for coming. Delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Professor Caroline Mansfield to you today. Uh, Caroline graduated from Murdoch University in Perth. Uh, she worked in mixed and small animal practice in both Australia and the UK before completing a three-year residency in small animal medicine at University College Dublin. Um, and there she developed uh, an interest in gastroenterology and she's continued that clinical and research passion uh, on gastroenterology uh, since her return to Australia in 2001. Um, from 2001 until 2010, she was employed back at Murdoch University as a clinical registrar and then lecturer and senior lecturer. Um, and she moved to us here at the University of Melbourne in late 2010 as the head of small animal medicine. Um, she's currently professor and director of the UVET Hospital, and Caroline is going to talk to us today um, about that passion and about her research. Um, everything begins in the gut and all about the microbiome, so thanks. Great. Um, I, uh, when I started doing this talk, um, I sort of done a, a recent spate of different talks on this particular topic, um, and I hope that I finish in time, because I probably could talk for about um, five hours, potentially, um, on this, and, and I'm sure... Um, that there might be some occupational health and safety issues if I keep you locked in this room for, for that long. So um, I guess just to sort of start with, when we talk about the gut microbiome, we're, we're talking about the, the community of microorganisms that we can identify within the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so the microbiome, which is the community of the microorganisms in a, in a biological um, sample. For the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to be talking about the oral microbiome, which is... Uh, phylogenetically and functionally quite different from the GI microbiome. We know that the human faeces contains approximately 10 to the power of 8 to 10 to the power of 10 bacteria per gram, which is roughly equivalent to the same number of mammalian cells in the body. If you read some of the early um, publications, they'll actually say that there are more bacterial cells than mammalian cells in the body, but that's actually been shown to be incorrect. And there are over 500 bacterial species in the human gut. And there's quite a similar distribution of bacterial species in the canine and the feline gut. We know, <coughs> of course, that the microbiome contains things other than bacteria, although these are less studied. Viruses outnumber bacteria about tenfold in number, but only contribute about 2 to 5% of the total DNA within the gut and the majority of those are actually bacteriophages. There are also archaea and fungi that are present, um, including methanogens, which are very, very difficult to identify. And we're only beginning to elucidate what the normal function of those particular organisms are as well. So <coughs> there has been a huge explosion in knowledge about the microbiome, and I use that term quite loosely because we certainly have had a lot of publications. Um, this is from ResearchGate, and that would suggest that in the year 2000, there were roughly 4,000 publications on the gut microbiome alone. And I think that, unfortunately, that knowledge or that identification of all of the bacteria doesn't necessarily reflect what our understanding, or we haven't quite come to a conclusion about what all of that data um, means. So, the explosion or the increase in knowledge has correlated with the development of non-culture methods because about 85% of bacteria that are present in the gut can't be cultured using traditional methods. So the techniques that are most um, commonly used in veterinary medicine include uh, fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization, quantitative real-time PCR and next generation sequencing. So when we use um, fish, we use it because it allows us to look spatially at where the bacteria are located. It's semi-quantitative, but not particularly um, you know, overall quantitative. And we can only use it when we know our target organism. So where fish was perhaps most useful was in the model um, of granulomatous colitis, which, was in boxer, which we identified in boxer dogs. Granulomatous colitis is quite similar to Crohn's disease in people, and it's been shown to be due to an adherent invasive E. coli. And the photo on the left is from a normal colon sample, and you can see that the highlighted E. coli, which are red, um, with a little um, 
quite conveniently placed arrows, are just sitting in the mucus on top of the epithelium. And they're not adherent and they're not causing any kind of inflammation. On the right is a, bi a colonic biopsy from an affected um, boxer dog. Um, you can't even really tell what is the mucosa, you know, what is the, the normal epithelium. Um, and the E. coli or the red staining bacteria are actually invading and setting up this quite um, florid um, inflammatory process. And so with these particular dogs, we were actually able to show not only did they have an adherent and invasive E. coli, they had a larger number of bacteria and they also had a lower diversity. So when we look at, again at the affected dogs, this time on the left, um, although the total number of bacteria was higher, the diversity was less and they were predominantly E. coli, whereas the healthy dogs on the right had a higher diversity and lower bacterial numbers. And we were also able to show that with eradication um, of the disease and with eradication of the E. coli, um, that this reverted to normal. Since then, there's been quite a lot of Genetic studies looking at boxer dogs and they've identified that there's an inability to do intracellular killing of this particular bacteria um, and identified similar genetic polymorphisms in French bulldogs and other breeds that kind of look a little bit like boxers with the, with the squashed faces. So when we um, use next generation sequencing, um, what we do is we use a universal primer, which again is usually a 16S RNA, we then sequence the amplicons, they're usually done in, in parallel, in massive runs, trim for quality, and then we match to known bio, um, databases using the bioinformatics pathway. Typically, the most um, commonly used is CHIME, um, and CHIME's undergone quite a few reiterations over the years. So the issues that we have with the veterinary studies, and presumably the same with a lot of the medical studies, is that the studies that don't necessarily compare even the same methodology with the next generation sequencing. So there can be variabilities in what region of the bacteria are amplified. We can potentially miss changes in low numbers if bacteria aren't particularly um, prevalent. We also, I guess, don't know what we don't know. So if they're not there in a database to be matched, we potentially might um, miss them. Um, and if we are looking at the fecal microbiome, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that it's an intestinal um, bacteria that's interacting with the intestinal mucosa system. And just because we detect either an absence or a presence in a particular group or cohort of animals, it doesn't mean that they're a functionally important group of bacteria because there's probably a lot of redundancy between the various bacteria. And the biggest challenge for the veterinary studies is that they're very expensive to run. So we're often limited in numbers of cases that we can potentially do. So we usually only have small numbers um, in our studies. So <coughs> some methodologies to try and overcome those, to try and determine whether um, what the functionality is and whether we can um, potentially look at identifying uh, what the bacteria mean. We can use metagenomics to try and identify the functionality or the encoded genes um, of the bacteria where we actually fragment and randomly amplify the genomic DNA that's present in the sample. Again, that produces an enormous amount of data and we don't necessarily know whether those um, genes are actually correlating to an expression and a functional change. So that's led into even more omics expansion, so transcriptomics looking at RNA expression, proteomics, metabolomics and sterile biomics, which is looking at bile acid expression. And so each one of these different omics um, characterizations means a creation of even more data and greater data banks for us to be looking at to try and actually figure out what these potential changes are. And so kind of that's what um, we end up looking at when we're trying to interpret all of this data. So as veterinarians are rather simple, um, there has been a development of something called a dysbiosis index in dogs, which is to try and, I guess, quantify or have a simple index that's available to compare different groups. And so this dysbiosis index was developed by Texas A&M GI lab. Um, and what they did is they took, a, I think, about 
um, 60 uh, healthy dog samples and about 70 samples from dogs that had chronic enteropathy, which is what we loosely call IBD, or inflammatory bowel disease in dogs. And they did uh, Illumina sequencing, and then they did this really complicated mathematical algorithm to compare the two different groups. And they came up with <laughs> the eight bacterial families which were most different between the two groups. And they did a quantitative PCR for those eight bacterial families plus the universal primer. So it ends up being a nine quantitative PCR to come up with a dysbiosis index. They then tested it on a further cohort of healthy dogs and dogs um, with chronic enteropathy. <laughs> and so what they had shown with this is that in the US dogs, or in the population of dogs that are being, or samples that are being submitted to this particular laboratory, that a negative dysbiosis index means that they are more likely to have a normal um, bacterial microbiome, whereas a positive um, dysbiosis index correlates to dysbiosis. But as you can see from this particular graph, there still is quite a lot of overlap, and there probably is some geographical variation that hasn't potentially, or a potentially degree variation that hasn't been fully elucidated yet. So why are we interested clinically in the microbiome? Well, the microbiome or the gut is the biggest immune organ in the body. Um, and it's the major interface between the immune system and the external environment. Um, and there is an interaction between the gut and distant organs as well. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting work that's going on. So when we talk about uh, flu, and quite often when people have influenza, true flu, you know, not, not sad flu, but true flu, um, they often will end up with signs of diarrhoea, and that's usually associated because the, um, the, lung, uh, the changes in the lung and the inflammatory sign that the inflammatory stimulus in the lung will actually cause a change in um, permeability um, and a loss of homeostasis in the gut. Okay, so, which is why we often have diarrhea associated with influenza as well. So the um, immune system uh, is composed of the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So it's the pays, patches, um, isolated lymphoid follicles, as well as the mucosal draining um, lymph nodes. And this immune system is exquisitely balanced to recognize and deal with pathogens as well as being able to control um, and not over-respond to harmless antigens, um, such as dietary antigens or commensal microbiota. So the innate immune system is probably the most important component of this within the gut, and it's the first line um, of the host defense. There are a lot of structural components, including mucus and epithelium, um, that are also quite important as well. Um, and the effector cells of this innate immune system are, are the natural killer cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and eosinophils. <coughs> when it comes to um, looking at this in, in the light, in the prism of clinical um, gastrointestinal disease or gastroenterology, the pattern recognition receptors or PRRs are really quite important. These are the ones that are expressed by the epithelial cells or those effector cells, and they recognize the common structures um, in the microbes, both pathogenic and commensal microbes. So these are our toll-like receptors and our nod-like receptors, and then also the rig-like receptors as well. And these are present in health, but usually at, at quite low levels. And I guess the reason why we are interested in them clinically is that, um, is that the NOD2 in particular is a major susceptibility uh, for Crohn's disease. So polymorphisms in that particular gene will increase the risk um, of developing Crohn's disease because the innate immune system overreacts or overresponds to normal commensal um, organisms. And that we know in veterinary medicine, uh, the German Shepherd, which is predisposed to a lot of GI disease, that, um, that there are probably there are polymorphisms in the toll-like receptors as well. So, <coughs> as well as 
having um, this important um, function in recognizing, um, recognizing microbiome, the actual immune system itself needs um, bacteria to work. Um, and I'm sorry that this table is really quite um, busy, but it's actually been shown that in, in germ-free models, that if there are no bacteria present, there are a whole bunch of um, changes both anatomically and histologically to the actual gut itself, but there are also distant immunological and functional um, changes or deficits um, that occur as a result um, of uh, having no, uh, no bacteria within the mucosal system. So what does the gut microbiome once the actual immune system and the microbiome is established, what role and, and how does it actually work in health? Well, the gut microbiome is unique for each individual. Um, there is high variability in childhood, um, and it's quite different in old age, but it's relatively stable during most of your adulthood, although it can be affected um, by disease and antimicrobials and it's also affected by delivery method. And although it's unique, it does tend to cluster in families and households. And the two major entrotypes that have been identified in people is the Western and the vegetarian biotype, which correlates to um, diet. In dogs, probably we haven't identified an entrotype to that degree, but diet is probably the biggest influence. Um, and changes in all components of the diet, including fat, protein, carbohydrate, and fiber might all, con all contribute. Um, and potentially the quality of those subcomponents is as important as the quantity of those subcomponents in impacting the microbiome. So this recent study, which came out um, looking at the comparison between a BARF diet, which if you haven't heard of, it's got, it's an acronym that can be called several different things, so it's a bones and raw food diet or a biologically appropriate raw food diet, um, because uh, there is an overwhelming consensus that dogs should be fed a natural diet, um, because dogs should be fed like the wolf, their wolves' ancestors. Um, I, I personally don't believe that chihuahuas have an awful lot genetically in common <laughs> with wolves, but um, but it certainly is a, a, a widely held assumption. So this study compared BARF diets with commercial diets, and generally um, the, the BARF diets were, as expected, higher in protein and fat and lower, um, lower in fibre. When they then did... <coughs> um, this is a really busy slide again, I apologise. They measured the faecal dysbiosis index um, and they found that there were differences in the dysbiosis index, um, so that the dogs with fed the BARF diet had a higher dysbiosis index than dogs that were fed the commercial diet. None of them were clinically unwell, but a lot of them were trending towards what would be considered to be a dysbiosis um, if we were to use it, if we were to use the dysbiosis index with that. They didn't um, then delve further to try and figure out what component, whether it was the protein or the fibre, um, that contributed specifically to that. Um, but that was probably predominantly contributed by the fact um, that it was Clostridium perfringens and E. coli that were, that were um, massively increased in the dogs that were fed bath. So what, a, what contribution does the microbiome make to health? Well, it ferments carbohydrates that are unable to be digested by mammalian GI tract enzymes. Um, it's preferential and dynamic, so it will change and it will adapt to life stages. Um, so some of the um, bacteria that can um, digest human milk oligosaccharides, for example, are only present um, in the first year of life and then will no longer be present um, following that. It's responsible for fermentation of fiber to, product, to produce short chain fatty acids. So acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And these uh, volatile or short chain fatty acids are an energy source, contribute up to 10% of the calories of the host. They have anti inflammatory functions directly on the colon, particularly butyrate. 
they will stimulate normal intestinal motility and they'll also protect against um, pathogenic overgrowth. And again, particularly um, butyrate and propionate will be protective against clostridial um, overgrowth in the colon by shifting the pH. And they're also considered to be quite important for regulating fatty acid, glucose, and cholesterol metabolism. They're also responsible for vitamin synthesis, particularly vitamin B, and there's some increasing interest in their role in vitamin K1 and K2 synthesis as well. And they um, you know, are involved in promoting normal apoptotic pathways and promoting normal tight junctions within the intestinal barrier um, by inducing degradation of tryptophan. And perhaps one of the, the major functions or the functions that is becoming increasingly studied is that they're responsible for um, production of secondary bile acids. And secondary bile acids are important in intestinal fat absorption, but they've also been increasingly studied for how they regulate insulin um, and their anti-inflammatory functions. And particularly in obesity, the impact of secondary bile acids and with clostridial difficile associated um, diarrhea, the role of these secondary bile acids is being increasingly studied. And so um, this is considered to be a really important area um, of the GI microbiome. So what about um, when it goes wrong? How can the microbiome be associated with disease? So there is, or it has been documented that there is a dysbiosis in a wide variety of inflammatory diseases, um, particularly with asthma, A to B, A to P diabetes, and obesity. And in a landmark Canadian study, um, it was shown that if there were the four bacteria, which is FLVR and I think I remember them, but each time I have to go back and remember the names of these four. Um, if these are acquired in the first three months of life, regardless of your genetic background, you dramatically decrease the risk of developing asthma later on in life. Um, so, uh, and that was a, that's a, a pretty amazing um, breakthrough to come out. So that's, I guess, correlated as well to the hygiene hypothesis um, as well. The impact of the microbiome or the dysbiosis is even more amplified um, in the presence of obesity. And that's because of the inflammatory effects or inflammatory impacts of, of um, obesity, because there will be um, potential for there to be decreased tight junction function um, within the intestinal epithelium. So we can have um, leaky gut, um, we'll have uh, metabolic endotoxemia, um, as well as uh, various changes, inflammatory changes systemically. The interest in the obesity relationship between the microbiota started in this um, really elegant experiment that was um, done by Turnbull back in, was published in 2008. Although the experiment was very elegant, my graphics are not very elegant, so I do apologize for those. So they had four colonies of basic standard germ-free mice, and they implanted a um, uh, the microbiome or microbiota feces from uh, obese prone mice, so that's a fat poo on the right, uh, to two of the groups, and then they had a lean mice um, gavage or microbial transplantation, which they did to two, so thin poo, fat poo, so I've tried to do. Um, to each of the different uh, uh, colonies, they fed either a low fat diet or a high fat diet. And again, mouse chow looks all the same, whether it's high fat or low fat. So I've, um, you know, I've taken some liberties in, in, in saying what those particular diets would be. And what they found was that irrespective of the diet, and these were all calorie, um, calorically the same, that the mice that were transplanted with the obese microbiome all developed an obese phenotype. This was then had a further landmark study where they actually looked at uh, the gut microbiota in twins, identical twins that were disconcordant for obesity. Um, so um, they found that these twins had a unique gut microbiome. And when they transplanted that human microbiota to mice, again, um, lean germ-free mice, the obese phenotype and the metabolic changes associated um, 
with that obesity uh, were also transferred, regardless of the diet that the animals were receiving. However, when they co-housed the mice that were given the lean microbiome with the obese microbiome, the obesity didn't develop. And this was postulated to be due to the fact that these mice are coprophagic, and so that the obese mice were eating the lean microbiome, um, and that the rescue um, of the obese mice was associated with an increase or a colonisation of bacteroides from the lean mice. And this impact or this rescue was actually enhanced when they were also fed a low-fat diet as well. So <coughs> when it comes to people and what that means is probably, I guess, the, the fastest growing surgical procedure in the Western world is bariatric surgery. Um, it's probably got the longest waiting list um, in Australia potentially at the moment. And one of the, the reasons why they postulate that there are, there are different types of surgery um, and the ones that are most successful are the ones that actually alter the GI microbiome. And that's thought to be because of the alteration in bile acids and the impact that the bile acid has on, um, on the various FXR receptors in the insulin um, metabolism um, and reducing uh, all the metabolic effects that also go with obesity. So we haven't quite got to fecal transplants as treatment for obesity yet, but there's certainly a lot of discussion um, of that being a potential treatment. There are other emerging connections, um, so the gut-lung axis, which suggests that if there's a, a trigger such as an allergic response in the, in the lung, um, that there can be a change in the microbial um, uh, uh, microbiome of, of the lung. The lung has a, a low microbiome, low quantity of microbiome, but it's very diverse. Um, and then if that's treated with antibiotics, it will then go on to having a dysbiosis and an alteration in the gut microbiome as well. What's perhaps even more exciting and particularly exciting, I think, or interesting um, in veterinary medicine is the gut-brain axis, which is considered to be a bi-directional um, axis um, between the enteric autonomic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And this um, is a communication between the gut microbiome, um, bile acids, short-chain fatty acids, and cytokines, um, and it's mediated by mood, cognition, emotion, and stress, which is all the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, and it will influence gut motility. Um, it will influence uh, gut permeability. And it's potentially one of the reasons why during times of stress, conditions such as Crohn's disease will be amplified or exacerbated, uh, why during stressful periods, people might have GI symptoms. Um, and it's also potentially why um, when there are psychosocial um, diseases or factors, uh, GI um, conditions might also be present. There has been <coughs> a lot of studies as well that have been looking at manipulating or modifying the gut microbiome to see whether there can be any um, influence on um, learning, behaviour, memory, stress and anxiety. And in a lot of the rodent models, they've actually shown that you can decrease anxiety or stress with specific um, uh, probiotic treatment um, and that you can actually also increase learning and memory with specific uh, treatments. There is a lot of um, interest in a variety of uh, diseases or neurological diseases in people to see whether there's a connection between microbiome um, and, uh, and the CNS diseases. Uh, Parkinson's and autism, um, at the moment, there's a fairly weak correlational level of evidence um, that the dysbiosis is um, a cause or exacerbates the disease or the manipulation of the microbiome will lead to any um, improvement. But there is um, 
a moderate and emerging uh, body of evidence that treatment of uh, or modification of the microbiome will help with hepatic encephalopathy, depression, and Alzheimer's. And particularly with Alzheimer's, they'll actually find that the GI signs actually precede um, the neurological signs by decades. And so potentially, if that can be spotted or identified beforehand, there might be the potential to intervene and intervene early. So back to, to my species, or the species that I'm interested in, what, um, what evidence is there about the gut-brain axis? So there's a probiotic that's not available in Australia yet that, that has been released um, in the US, and it's a bifidobacterium longum, which was actually isolated from calm dogs. Okay, so they did all these stress and anxiety tests, and they identified the calmest dogs, um, and they did sequencing, and they identified the um, bifidobacterium, and they cultured it and produced it, and then did a whole bunch of testing. And so now it's released um, as a commercial probiotic. Um, and certainly the evidence is that it is effective for treating stress and anxiety um, in dogs and reducing um, that, those behavioural um, abnormalities. We also know that some probiotics will be helpful for reducing kenneling stress, so the diarrhoea that's manifested um, in kennels and catteries. And we also know that supplementation of medium chain triglycerides will improve cognitive or improve cognitive function um, in dogs that are showing senility type changes and will also reduce the incidence of seizures in epileptic dogs as well. And that's been um, coming out in the last one to two years, mostly as abstracts, but um, the peer review publications are going to be coming out. And as well as providing energy, the, those medium chain triglycerides do, do alter the microbiome. So I guess the next step is actually proving that that's the mechanism by which um, the triglyceride supplementation actually works. Um, and I guess the last area that's um, potentially quite interesting is the, the gut-kidney axis, which is where microbial end products that accumulate with um, uh, uremia will actually exacerbate um, systemic inflammation and perpetuate ongoing kidney disease. And so with people with chronic kidney disease, um, it's been again identified that they have a decrease in particular um, bacterial families, and there is some emerging evidence that um, probiotic treatment with those particular families will benefit um, in their overall management and can lead to some improvement and resolution um, of some of the clinical science. It doesn't reverse the damage that's there, but it might ameliorate some of the ongoing, ongoing changes. So um, what about dysbiosis in, in GI disease? And this is where I'm going to revert back to, um, to dogs because um, the level of evidence that's out there about uh, the human field is, is massive. Um, so we do know that dysbiosis occurs in all enteropathies, both acute and chronic, but there is a, a lack of consensus um, in the dog studies about chronic enteropathy. And that's probably because the studies are of different breeds who likely have different diseases or different um, you know, phenotypes and genotypes. Um, the studies are, get different treatments, um, different samples, and there, are probably, and there are also different methodologies in the analysis. Um, but we do, again, know that there is a dysbiosis. Um, the most recent paper that looked at the dysbiosis index, uh, again, showed um, that the vast majority of dogs with chronic enteropathy in this particular study um, had a dysbiosis index greater than zero. It's kind of a self-fulfilling um, philosophy, though, because this is from the same group that actually made the dysbiosis index. So, um, However, they did improve with um, clinical resolution. We also know that um, cats with diarrhoea will have a, a dysbiosis. Um, so this is a principal component analysis um, and with the... A graph on the left, this will come up on my thing. Um, the red dots are from um, cats with diarrhea, whereas the blue squares are healthy cats, and the one on the right, um, acute diarrhea is in red, chronic diarrhea in blue. And it's a little bit hard to tell, but all the healthy cats are down here. So they cluster quite differently in the principal component analysis. We also know that there's a dysbiosis in acute diarrhea. And Perhaps the most interesting um, 
paper that's come out for me recently was this one that looked at the long-term effects of canine parvovirus in dogs. And so this particular group, um, group looked at um, you know, uh, the dogs that survived parvo, which is you know, roughly 90 to 95% of dogs that are treated for puppies that are treated for parvo will survive. And they actually found that there was a five to six um, fold increase in the risk of GI disease, chronic GI disease in those puppies later in life compared to the normal population. And so this um, you know, begs the question about why this might happen. Um, and it's probably because most puppies are going to be less than 12 weeks of age. So this is where the microbiome is most rapidly developing. And most puppies with parvo are going to be treated with antibiotics. And so as well as having the viral infection, they're also being treated with antibiotics during the period of most rapid development. This same group um, also compared have um, an unpublished study where they're looking at um, acute hemorrhagic diarrhea syndrome, which is um, thought to be due to a clostridial toxin, usually is in adult dogs, young adult dogs, um, and it's traditionally not treated with antimicrobials. Um, and in the abstract presented recently, they found no increased risk in chronic GI disease. Um, an area that I'd be really interested in looking at is what the impact on behaviour is on these particular dogs, um, parvo puppies, uh, because their survey didn't look at behavioural um, abnormalities. But um, I guess for all of those studies and, um, that we have, the biggest problem that we have is, I guess, the chicken or the egg um, situation, is whether the dysbiosis has driven the inflammation or whether the inflammation has driven the dysbiosis. Um, but clinically, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of academic um, because we have a dysbiosis and we have inflammation um, and, and we want to try and resolve both. So where are our knowledge gaps in veterinary medicine? Well, when should we manipulate the microbiome for treatment of metabolic and inflammatory disease? Um, how can we better understand the development of the microbiome so that we don't do so much harm potentially to, um, uh, to puppies and kittens? Um, and then also, I guess, learning how to interpret all those studies to try and determine what's really important or really relevant because there's so much data out there. And that's my knowledge gap. Anyway, it might, might not be yours, but that's mine. Um, so what studies have we done? I'm going to briefly talk about the studies that we've done to date um, and then what we're doing and what we plan to do. Um, so the first study that we, we did was looking at the faecal microbiota of cats with um, diabetes mellitus. And diabetes in cats is analogous to type 2 diabetes in people in, in that it's not a, a, an absolute insulin deficiency. They have a relative insulin deficiency um, or it's a insulin resistance. Um, so we looked at the faecal microbiota in these particular cats um, and we looked at um, age, gender, breed, dietary fat, protein, carbohydrate and whether the diet was wet or dry and we found no difference um, between uh, the microbiome between healthy cats, between diabetics and non-diabetics. We age and breed match controlled um, our non-diabetic cats. We did do um, quantitative PCR on Fecal bacterium and there was a decrease in cats that were older than 10 years of age. But that was the only difference that we found. Um, the limitations for that particular study were, were numbers, um, you know, with our ability to recruit numbers, the stage of the diabetic diagnosis, not all of the cats were at the um, early stages of diagnosis. Um, and we also didn't do functional assessment, so we didn't look at um, metabolome with those cats. So there might have been a difference in the functionality of that, that microbiome that we were unable to identify. We've also done, um, yet to be published, but we've also looked at the development and stability of the microbiome. So we've, um, we're fortunate to cooperate with Guide Dogs Victoria. Um, so we were able to have two litters of, um, of puppies that we were able to follow the mothers from two weeks before birth and then follow the puppies up until 12 weeks of age. And then we recruited healthy dogs through, um, through the UVet clinic where we were followed them. Um, monthly for six months, and we've got fecal samples 
on monthly. And we looked at them uh, at three to 12 months of age, uh, one to seven years of age, eight to 10 years of age, and 11 to 15 years of age. What we found is that once they um, reached a year of age, that, or probably three months of age, the microbiome was relatively stable, um, both at a phylum and at a class level. Um, and the biggest differences were in the mothers um, and the puppies up to about three months of age. We also found that, that the diversity was greatest in these puppies um, and the mothers and lowest in the senior dogs, um, which correlates um, quite um, closely to people as well. The mothers and the puppies clustered differently. And what was really interesting was that the mothers changed um, before the, the puppies. Um, so they shifted their microbiome um, so that they had bacteria that were able to digest milk two weeks before they gave birth. Um, and so then they could pass on their microbiome to the puppies, um, which I think is really, I think nature's quite clever. Um, and we all also, this is a um, one, um, one time point from one puppy. Uh, so day zero, um, week zero, uh, which was like the next day, week one, week two, week three, and so on up to week 14. And so as you can see that once we reach about week six, it, start, it starts to normalise, but the biggest change um, is certainly within those first um, three to four weeks, and that coincides, I guess, with the introduction of solid food. Um, the other thing that we found quite interesting is we were able to have one meconium sample, um, and it was not sterile, um, which was we thought was quite interesting. Um, and when we were when we were processing these samples, we couldn't use our normal fecal protocol kit until we got to about week four or five because um, the the feces was unable to be processed normally. We actually had to use the uh, the kits that are normally used for milk, um, you know, for testing milk because that's basically what they were as it was coming out the other end. So we know that in health it's fairly stable. Biggest rate of change is up to 12 weeks. Um, some other studies that sort of feed into that is that we know that the dietary components um, will have different impacts. And some really interesting work actually shows that the impact of diet has more, imp more has a greater change <laughs> in obese dogs than in lean dogs. Um, and that small changes in dietary fibre can lead to big changes in the fecal microbiome as well. This was one um, interesting thing that we had with our, our old dogs um, that we looked at. So our 11 to 15 year old dogs. So these dogs were all kept on the same diet, all healthy, no change um, in anything else. And as you can see, this is from one dog that completed all six months, relatively clustered together quite nicely. Um, and then this was from one dog, this was at its first time point, and then this were at where its next two time points. Um, and then when it was due to come back for its four month um, assessment, uh, the owner said, I, you know, something's not quite right, I don't think my dog's as healthy as it used to be. Um, and we then um, assessed it and the dog had developed signs of uh, chronic kidney disease. But um, prior to uh, uh, enrolment in the study it had been completely normal. And so, you know, we'd like to postulate that the change in the microbiome preceded the blood um, changes or the detectable blood changes in clinical signs as well. But that's N equals 1. Mm -hmm. um, we've also started to look at that, and I'm conscious of time here, so I'm going to fly through. We've also looked at bacteria um, coated with immunoglobulin, and this came from a paper that was published in, in, in Cell, and it, it comes from the premise that the fecal bacteria don't necessarily represent what's interacting with the intestinal immune system. Um, we also find ethically it's really hard to justify obtaining intestinal biopsies um, or anaesthetizing to get intestinal uh, mucosal brushing. Um, and we might not even then be necessarily obtaining the right site if we do so. So with this one, what we do is a mixture of flow cytometry to actually isolate the bacteria that are coated with immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G, um, and then do the sequencing on those particular bacteria. 
So we did healthy, we recruited healthy, 11 healthy dogs. We did those at two time points um, and dogs with chronic enteropathy or IBD um, at active disease and when they had active disease and when they were in clinical remission. Nine of those dogs responded to a diet, eight um, required antibiotic treatment and three were steroid, steroid responsive. We did total sequencing as well as the IgG and IgA coded as well. So what we found with our healthy dogs was that there, weren't, um, there was a low number of bacteria that were coated with IgA or IgG, and it was relatively stable between the two visits. When we looked at uh, dogs with disease, um, we did find that there was a significant difference um, between the dogs that had active disease and those um, with, that were in remission. And surprisingly, the number of bacteria that were coated went down, which was a little bit unexpected. Well, it wasn't unexpected that it went down, but that it was below the level of healthy animals, I guess. And there was a similar number with IgG. So when we look at this track with these individual animals, and I'll just break this down, um, we can see that most animals tended to decrease between um, active disease and remission with the IgA positive coating, um, as well as with the IgG coating, but the IgA was the most um, prominent we then tried to look at the different types of chronic enteropathy. Um, and so the diet responsive, the antibiotic responsive, and the steroid responsive. And what's really quite um, striking about this is with the steroid responsive, which by definition are the most severely affected dogs, they had the highest percentage um, of bacteria that were coated with IgA. Um, and there was very fairly no difference with the IgG coating. When we looked at the difference, I'll just go through this, when we looked at the difference in the bacteria, we did find that the Enterobacteriaceae and, um, so my tongue's gonna trip over this, Eris, that, that one, the Eris of Latripatia, um, had higher coatings during um, active disease compared to remission or healthy dogs. And what's been interesting is that both of those families in people are associated with a more severe form of colitis. And so it may be that that's particularly um, why it's associated with the steroid responsive um, disease or the more severe form of disease. Um, and that also we identified that, there, that the amount of coating was really unstable during disease. We've also looked at viruses. And I know there's at least one person in here who's interested in viruses. But um, so vir the virome is really difficult to try and um, identify because there's no preserved gene or protein and there's large volumes of data that are unmatched. Um, but what um, we do know about the human gut virome um, is that it's even more unique than the bacterial microbiome between people and that it's, it's quite stable long term. Um, so about 80% of the viral contigs in a particular individual will persist um, for over two and a half years. Um, and that with identical twins, um, although the GI microbiome will cluster and will be very similar, the virome is quite unique. Um, and that's considered to potentially be one of the reasons why um, there's a difference in Crohn's susceptibility um, between identical twins and also why fecal transplantation might work for clostridial difficile um, associated diarrhea tr uh, treatment. So, we have um, characterised the canine faecal virome in healthy dogs and dogs with acute diarrhoea. So this was done um, by um, Paloma, who's at, um, waiting for the results of her PhD submission, um, who had the joy of um, accosting people at uh, dog parks to get faecal samples while we were doing um, validation. And we did find that there were some eukaryotes identified in, in healthy dogs. Not every dog um, did have eukaryotic viruses, but there were some that were present. Um, and we did find some dogs with acute diarrhea that had um, eukaryotic viruses as well. So we investigated further um, some astrovirus, but when we did a prevalence study, we did not find an association with acute diarrhea. We also found that the majority of the dogs with acute diarrhea had a um, a larger percentage of bacteriophages than healthy dogs. 
And so then we went on to look at dogs with chronic enteropathy or our IVD population. Um, we looked at eight dogs. Three of the dogs had three different eukaryotic families. And again, we isolated a COVID virus um, from one of those dogs, which we then sequenced and did a prevalence study, but we couldn't find an increased incidence um, in dogs with chronic enteropathy. But what we did find was that dogs with our chronic enteropathy had um, almost 100% of their virome um, was bacteriophages. And the majority of those, sorry if I just go through, were unmatched um, to anything in the database. So it's kind of what we call the dark matter. Okay. We don't know what it is or, or where, where it's at. And so we don't quite know what the, the function or the significance of those viruses are yet, but we do know that they are present um, both in health and disease. So what else are we doing now? We are doing an overall omic assessment of dogs with chronic enteropathy. So we're enrolling dogs. We call it IBD to try and recruit dogs, but we, it's really a chronic enteropathy. Um, we start with the diet trial, and if that's not successful, we're doing fecal microbial transplantation. Um, and then if that's not successful, then we go on to do um, immune suppression. Um, and we're looking at total microbiome um, immunoglobulin-coated post and fecal metabolome, whole blood stimulation to look at the inflammatory status um, and transcriptomics. We're targeting about 18 to 22 dogs to completion and we've got about 10 at the moment that have completed and another three that are in the pipeline. Um, we are also looking at some microRNA expression diet-induced changes in dogs. Um, we're uh, just about to embark on a prebiotic probiotic um, assessment on stress and microbiome in shelter dogs and cats, um, a metabolome study, and we're very we're working with uh, Washington State University just um, with Washington University sorry on virome dark matter, but that's at a very low level, um, and the impact of the meprazole on the fecal microbiome of dogs. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, um, that we have been discussing and we're looking at potentially trying to do. Um, so looking at use of a prebiotic or a probiotic in puppies with parvovirus, the long-term impact of parvovirus on behaviour, the use of a prebiotic for management of diabetic and or overweight cats, and there's a, a major obesity project in dogs that um, we're really hoping eventually we'll get some um, industry function, um, funding for that we're trying to get off the ground as well. And that's just to thank all of the postgrad students and collaborators um, that have had all of the heavy lifting for these projects. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Sorry, it's rushing. fascinating. Well, I hope more enlightened about our own life, appreciative of, uh, of the power of it mm. um, and the significance of it. Um, we did have this time, kind of familiar public with the yeah. Just, um, <clears throat> With the Ig coding of bacteria, uh, do the bacteria on the outside have like receptors or um, Yes, yes. So some bacteria are more likely to be coated, like more likely to be. I think it's probably, yes, yes, there are um, some bacteria more likely to be coated. So there will be some that will still interact with the immune system in other ways that we will miss with the IgG and the IgA coating. Will those receptors be characterised the bacteria mm -hmm. from the bacteria? No, not to my knowledge. Are there any extra zones that carry Not, you might need to explain it. I'm not sure that I actually understand that question. That's probably well, the encapsulated uh, fragments and uh, nucleic acids and the fragments and the blood. Yep. There may, there may have been, but there's none that, none that I'm aware of. Do you think that we have effective interventions to 
one off treatment producer a longitudinal change in the microbiome, or do they tend to revert back when you have an ongoing infection? So um, it's a great question, um, and the answer is it depends. Um, for a probiotic to have an impact, it needs to be continued for the duration that you want the impact. Um, so it's not going to be sustained beyond um, the time that you're taking the probiotic. Um, I heard an analogy which I thought was really apt in that the microbiome is kind of like an elastic band and, um, and it depends on how many times you stretch it as to whether it reverts back to normal or not. Um, so with, with C. difficile treatment in people, um, there's a success rate of over 90% with two faecal transplantations. Um, in, in our dog cohort, we've probably got, with faecal transplantations, one treatment will be successful in over 50%, but some dogs will require more. It's really um, unpre unpredictable. And with probiotics, I think the biggest issue is that it's important that you have the right um, bacteria or bacterial byproducts in that probiotic that have the right genetic structure for the right microbiome and the right genotype for the condition that you're trying to treat. So I think part of the problem is people just reach for a probiotic to treat everything and and, and it's not going to as well. Okay. How do you deal with um, quality assessment when you're doing food transplant? <laughs> how, how can you be sure that you're not transplanting something else? Nasty? So um, we, our donors, um, are usually our dogs, um, and we will, we will do a faecal PCR panel, um, and we'll do a dysbiosis index. Um, no antibiotic or proton pump inhibitors, um, or history of uh, behavioural problems or GI problems, skin disease, and no, um, no diet change. So because they're staff owned or vet owned we kind of have a pretty good idea um, with those. Um, what we, we don't know what the long-term impacts are in terms of if we're transferring, a, you know, maybe not a gut phenotype, but maybe we're transferring something else. They don't know that in people either. And there's a, there's a worry about increased risk of autoimmune disease with people and faecal transplants as well. I suspect it's probably the lack of fibre, um, and it, 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 I suspect it's the lack of fibre because I think just as many healthy dogs can potentially have secret pitching spores and Campylobacter as well, and, and be healthy but not have a um, not have a dysbiosis. Um, maybe that's a discussion for you afterwards, <laughs> but uh, because I, I, I don't think they're all they're all clinically ab abnormal, but um, I think it's probably the fibre and the biggest. Um, the biggest trend in um, pet food at the moment is um, is grain free diet. But when if you look at if you do look at wild dogs in the in wild dogs when they hunt they go straight for the rumen of whatever they've killed and they'll eat all the digested grass and grain. Um, and it's associated with DCN, like dilated cardiomyopathy now. In dogs. Okay, I'm sure we've got some other questions, but I'll just call it over. So um, thank you again, Caroline, and let's all uh, thank you.